button. Hangout is now live. Now, just let me check to make sure it hasn't put us live, which I'm, I'm pretty sure it hasn't, but I'll just check just in case. Because, you know, I, I really don't want to be seen in public with you, Bane. <laughs> no, I just want to save this till the end of the video, so. I, I'd never be able to live it down. <laughs> oh, my God. You, you, never know, you never know. I might make it to Canada one day. I'd like to make it you to Canada. You hang out with that long-haired hippie freaking in the Kool-Aid jug? What the fuck? <laughs> Anyway, it looks like it's um, right, so let's let's get stuck into it. Um, All right. So I'm, I'm joined by Karen, and um, we're going to talk a bit about Earl Silverman. It was only a couple of days ago. It was the three-year anniversary of his death. So I thought maybe we'd chat a bit about Earl. Um, I never had the opportunity to meet him because I'm on the other side of the world. But you met him personally and, and knew him personally. Could you tell us a bit about who he was and what he did and a bit about the man? Uh, he was like, he was a bit of an odd duck. He was, he was a very um, compassionate uh, man. He was very focused. Um, he was uh, almost monomaniacal in terms of, of uh, what he saw as his calling. Um, and I think he found uh, his calling when he walked out of an abusive uh, relationship and and essentially found nothing but um, from no, no services for men other than uh, services available to batterers. Um, so anger management and things like that. Yeah, I've heard this uh, quite a bit. Um, the the one in three program in Australia, which uh, says that one in three victims of domestic abuse of men has uh, made that point before that when men have called uh, to try to get help as victims, they're being directed towards uh, abuse services, for, uh, services for abusers to get help. Yeah, Denise Hines, uh, she's done a lot of interesting research on sort of the um, uh, the other side of domestic abuse, the other side of intimate partner assault and uh, and intimate partner sexual coercion and things like that. And she she actually authored a study on the experiences of men who reached out for assistance, uh, reached out for help from, uh, you know, government funded programs and community services and things like that. And she found that a significant um, portion of men uh, found that every, they found that the only things they found, their experience was that when they called a hotline, um, a large minority of the time they were just laughed at, um, by the person on the other end of the line. Um, you're joking, right? And, uh, often they were referred, um, the, the person on the other end of the line was sort of helpful or seemed sort of helpful in the terms of like, oh, I'm, I'm going to give you a referral to this, you know, service. And, and then they realized that it wasn't helpful because the service when they called was a batterer treatment program. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you essentially have this situation where probably about two thirds of men um, have had extremely uh, at least two thirds of men have had extremely negative experiences uh, when reaching out for help from any uh, any hotline, crisis line, uh, domestic violence service, shelter, anything. Um, there are a few, a, a small handful of services that are for both men and women. Most of them operate primarily through uh, the way Earl did, through private donations, private funding. Uh, they don't get a lot of uh, support from taxpayer dollars. And uh, so they're, they're a little harder to find. When men find those, they tend to get help. Um, so would you say there's, there's starting to be a change? It's starting to, uh, is there starting to be more help for men, do you think? Um, I don't think that they're starting to be, uh, well, 
there there's a little bit more help from for men um, in terms of uh, you know crisis lines the people on the other end are, are not probably as likely to laugh at you and call you an asshole as uh, as they were 10 or 15 or 20 years ago um, but there there really isn't a whole lot in terms of concrete support uh, you know like there's there's a voice on the other end of the phone that's sympathetic mm. you're more likely to find that now than you were 20 years ago when than, than you were when Earl started his crisis line right that he operated out of his own pocket for over 20 years but um, so you're, you're more likely to get a sympathetic voice on the end of the phone, but that doesn't necessarily translate into actual services, actual assistance, um, actual, uh, you know, a roof over your head or, or anything like that. And um, it definitely doesn't necessarily translate into a, a system that can legitimate your choice to take your children out of an abusive environment. And this is one of the things that I stress over and over and over and over again, because I believe that men are less likely to use shelters when they're abused uh, than women are. I think that many men are more likely to want to go to a hotel room or couch surf with friends or go stay with their parents or something, even live in their car, then go and seek help at a domestic abuse shelter. Okay. If, if they are leaving on their own with no kids in tow, right? A shelter may not be their first choice, right? Uh. But I mean, it may be, but it may not be. And I think that they're less likely than women to feel like they need to lean on that. But one thing that shelters for men would do for men uh, with children is it would legitimate their choice to leave with their kids, right? And this is one thing men do not have. Men have three choices when their spouse, when they have kids and their spouse is abusive, they can stay and take it, or they can leave without the kids. And that's abandonment. And they've yeah. just fucked over any custody battle that they might want to launch, right? Or you, they you're take... You're unlikely to leave your kids in that situation. Yeah, no, of course. You, you stay and you take it to protect your kids. Or you leave and y you, you are literally abandoning your kids because there mm -hmm. is no way after legal abandonment of that sort that you're going to get custody. So you're, you're, that's a per, that's permanently leaving them in the custody of an abusive woman. Um, or you <clears throat> commit a felony, right? You By taking you, your kids. Uh, take your kids to a hotel or take your kids to your parents or take your kids, you know, somewhere. Um, and uh, that's, that's, felony kidnapping and custodial interference and all kinds of other things, right? Um, so, there is, so that's, on, that's only when men do it, though? I haven't well, looked because, at the law in, in this case. So. Oh, my God, I'm going to... Oh. <laughs> it's all right, I can edit this bit out, so... Okay. Thank um, you, Phil. Yeah. It's nobody. It's line one something. I don't fucking know. I'm not answering it. <laughs> um, anyhow, so you, you have this series of choices that men have. Now, women, don't, women aren't facing this choice. They may have been facing this choice before Aaron Pitsy came into being, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the exact same choice. But they don't face this choice now because even if they don't go to a shelter, right, they have an entire system that exists to legitimate their choice to leave with their children, right? So all they have to do is reach out for help, right? And then, then it's on the record, right, that the reason she's leaving is because she's being abused. The reason she's taking her, her kids is because she fears for their safety, right? It, it legitimates that choice, right? But because there are very, very few services, 
And none of these services, mind you, are government approved, right? Very, very few of them are um, funded by the government, uh, approved by the government, uh, legitimated by the government, right? Um, because of that, there is nothing to legitimate a man's decision to leave with his children. <clears throat> so he, he's essentially stuck. Um, if he wants to protect his kids, he's essentially stuck in the relationship. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's really no exit strategy for him, uh, to so leave we, uh, we really and need bring to it society's attitudes for, for that to, to change, right? Society's attitudes absolutely need to change. Um, you know, like it, it needs to, you know, there, there is something to be said for legislative change and, you know, and equality under the law and, you know, gender neutral laws and things like that. But, you know, the family uh, divorce law and, and family court law, right, on paper in the statutes, right, is generally gender neutral. Um, that doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be applied. And mm -hmm. when it comes to, um, when it comes to things like uh, shared parenting bills, alimony reform bills, and um, you know, sort of the renewal of the Violence Against Women Act, and and all of these kinds of things, um, politicians need to realize uh, that uh, doing what Governor Rick Scott did just last month, uh, maybe it was even this month, um, in vetoing an alimony reform bill that. It was the second iteration of this bill. The first one was in 2013, and he vetoed that one and uh, expressed what was concerning to him and why he'd vetoed it. So those things were altered, and then he vetoed it again at the behest of the National Organization for Women and several other women's groups and feminist groups. Um, he vetoed it despite it having passed both houses with overwhelming bipartisan support and having over 70% public approval. So this is a man who essentially allowed a special interest group to over, overturn the will of the people of his state and used his veto power to subvert and corrupt uh, the democratic process um, against the will of the people. And how much you wanna bet that he's not worried about getting reelected Mm. Right. That's what needs to change. Right. Politicians need to realize, right, that when they do shit like that, it's political death for them. Right. And they aren't going to ever get that message unless the public attitude changes. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I think the the first <clears throat> battleground is is um, the public attitude towards male victims, male victims in general, not just domestic violence, but yeah, we, we need to accept that men can be victims as well. Well, I think public attitudes, uh, like every single legislative change has been, um, it, it's been preceded by uh, an, a change in public attitudes. So, I mean, even if you look at, um, you know, sort of the decriminalization of sodomy Right, because sodomy used to be a crime. You know, being a gay man used to, you know, land you in prison, mm. um, or get you chemically castrated, or going further back, get you hanged. Um, you know, in in England and and even in Canada, uh, progressive Canada, we actually put gays in jail um, way back when. Public attitudes start to shift, right, and then there's enough. And sometimes it only takes about 10 or 15% of the population to be loud enough, right? About wanting a change, right? You have 10 or 15% of the people who are agitating for the change. You have a minority, large minority of people who don't care either way. And you can even have a large minority of people who are actively against that change but as long as you know as long as you have that 10 to 15 percent of people making a good case right then they can change public attitudes they shift the sort of the window of ideas that are considered to be polite 
dinner conversation, um, the Overton window, what, what's tolerable to be discussed in public. And, uh, and then that influences legislation. So the idea is not to go in and start rewriting laws. I don't think that anybody has ever really made uh, meaningful change just by going in and rewriting laws. Uh, you need the, to reach a, a tipping point in public opinion. Yes. Mm. And then the laws will change on their own. Yeah, then the politicians will follow because that's in their best interest. Oh. But you said earlier that Earl ran a, uh, a helpline for 20 years. Uh, it would have been over 20 years. Uh, it was, uh, he'd been running it for 20 years when I met him. So maybe 20, 22 years, something like that. Um, it was essentially, um, basically, uh, when he realized there were no services for men, he started a helpline. And I, as far as I know, he did kind of the, uh, really grassroots stuff. Like when you're trying to sell a sofa, you know, you, you put up a poster and it's got the little, you know, you cut the little tabs oh, rip, at the, the phone you know. number off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he did that. He postered every, everywhere in Calgary, you know, if you need help, you're a man, you need help, you know, your wife abusing you, blah, blah, blah. He did all kinds of stuff like that. He did outreach as much as he could. Um, and he helped lots and lots of people. He was actually a very uh, sort of close confederate with um, Senator Ann Cools. She was quite fond of him. And um, because she was, uh, she considers Aaron Pitsy to be her soul mate and soul sister, she said. Um, she, she was the one who started the shelters in Canada. That's how she got appointed to the Senate by uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Um, the father of the uh, cuck we have in uh, in Parliament now in the PMO's office, but uh, Pierre Trudeau was not quite as bad as as his son seems to be. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Pierre Trudeau was the one who said the nation uh, the government has no business in the nation's bedrooms when he decriminalized sodomy. He appointed Ann Cools, the first black female senator in North America, to the Senate. She is the longest currently sitting Canadian senator uh, at the moment. And um, don't know whether she's looking to retire anytime soon. Um, but she she was actually fairly uh, close with Earl, tried to help him out as much as she could. And um, you, you literally had uh, this guy is a one man army army of one and he was just trying to make a change and i don't know whether he had uh savvy as far as marketing or as far as pr right um but he was one of the most sincere people i ever have met in in the course of of this journey that i've been having through this this movement so he was um, funding funding that out of his own pocket. There was no yes. government help whatsoever. No. Uh, he 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 ended up getting one grant. He applied for a grant uh, mm. through I think the Ministry of Health and Human Services or something like that, and uh, they gave him a single grant of eight hundred dollars. Wow, that's what he got over the course of over twenty years from the mm. government. For the services he provided. So he, he started the helpline over 20 years ago. Um, wh yeah. Where did he go from there? Because he started a shelter out of his own house, didn't he? Wh when did he start that? And how did well, you know how that came about? Uh, he, he wanted to open, he'd wanted to open a shelter for quite some time and he was trying to get funding and he was again applying to uh, the Provincial Ministry of Health and Human Services uh, because they're the ones who disperse funds towards uh, victims of crime, victims of domestic violence, you know, all of that stuff, right? Mm. And uh, they kept telling him, well, you, domestic violence is a women's issue. So you have to be approved by SOW, Status of Women Canada, right? The Minister for the Status 
the minister responsible for the status of women, right, which is a federal position in Ottawa. And uh, it's essentially a cabinet minister, <clears throat> usually with health and human services, sometimes with some other uh, department, but they also have this other mandate, this other uh, uh, job to do, responsible for the status of women. Now, SOW has essentially veto power if, say, the Ministry of Health needs to get a study or something to the Minister of Justice. Um, if it pertains to women at all, if it pertains to something that's been designated a women's issue, so domestic violence, sexual assault, all of those sort of uh, wage equality, wa wage parity or, or whatever, equity, um, all of those things, right? If that report is going to get to the Minister of Justice's desk, it needs to first be vetted by the minister responsible for the status of women. And that report can stop right there on that desk and not go any further. Okay. This is the amount of power. So, if, so there is an inbuilt bias then. So how, how are we supposed to get help for male victims if we see the, the problem as only affecting females? This, this is one of the most atrocious things about what Earl went through um, because he like he opened his safe house uh, I believe it was two or three years before he died but he had been in a seven year legal battle right trying mm. to get human rights counsel um, hearing based on discrimination you know, he was he wanted to make a complaint to the Human Rights Council that the government was discriminating against him because he was male. And he was doing this based on the three or so years prior to that, that he was shut, shunted back and forth between the provincial ministry for health and human services. Right. Which would send him for, to status of women Canada, which would then sa say to him, well, that may be the case, but we are not responsible, right? We're allowed to discriminate against men, right? We're here for women. We're allowed to discriminate against men. Go to the Department of Health and Human Services. So then he'd go back and they'd say, well, but that's a women's issue. And they'd send him back to Status of Women Canada and back and forth, round and round we go, right? Essentially, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has one section saying, essentially, there shall be no discrimination on the basis of sex. And in the immediately immediate subsection below it, there is a clause that essentially says, except when we discriminate in favor of women. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it doesn't say that specifically. Yeah, but, but yeah. Given the body of case law, right, that is essentially what it means, right? The body of case law indicates that women are disadvantaged historically. And the, the bigger that body of case law is, the easier it is to prove the next case, even after women have overshot equality, even when women are actually privileged compared to men. It's it, because of that huge, huge, like 50 years of case law backing up each case, right? It, it becomes easier and easier to prove that women are being disadvantaged by ever smaller things, even when they actually have the advantage, right? So mm -hmm. it's this is an actual positive feedback loop that snowballs into a monster, right? And Earl came around at about the time that it had completely monsterized, and so essentially what you have is you have a you have a constitution. Right. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is our constitution that says all people are equal, but some are more equal than others. And you have an, a, a history, decades of case law saying women are disadvantaged. And the less disadvantaged they get, the easier it is to prove they're disadvantaged because of that case law. Right. And here you have a man, one guy with no lawyer. Right trying to get a human rights hearing, human, our human rights uh, council is the body that decides um, cases based on uh, discrimination, uh, you know, within, under the charter, our charter rights. 
violations of charter rights. He's trying to get a hearing and all of this is standing in his way, right? And not only is all of this case law and this little subsection that puts the kibosh on equality in our charter standing in his way, but he's got two lawyers, right? One of them is hired by the province, works for the province, and the other one works for the Alberta network of, of women's shelters, right? And he's pro se. He, it's just him. It's just yeah, this scruffy funding out of his own guy. pocket. Yeah. Yeah. The scruffy looking guy, right? Who who does building maintenance for a living, mm. right? He's I, I guess he was like a, a a superintendent of an apartment building, like a maintenance guy, and you know, like, and he's there trying to argue against these two lawyers to argue for his right to even have a hearing, let alone his right to win a hearing, his right to even have a hearing. And he was denied a hearing twice. And, and then we call this equality. Oh yeah. And so he, you know, the second time he was denied a hearing, he opened his shelter. Out of his own he pocket. Just, out of his own pocket and with some private donations. And he wasn't internet savvy enough. Um, he was not PR savvy enough. Uh, he, I doubt he had ever heard of Twitter or, you know, um, Patreon or, you know, if it well, Patreon, Patreon wasn't around, but if it was, you know, he, he would have been like completely out, out of the, you know, out of the loop on that. Um, he really uh, am, I correct? Not... am I correct in saying that the, the shelter was out of his own home? It, I believe it was his own home. Yes. Mm. He renovated it. He bought a home and he renovated it and he lived there. Right. Mm. I don't think it was his existing home. Right. I think he bought it specifically for okay. that purpose. Yep. And, uh, but he, he lived there. It was his home. So. So, so what happened next then? He opened the shelter and, and what happened from um, there? How many, how many years was it open? A uh, couple of years, uh, two, two and a yeah. half years. Um, he helped out, uh, he helped out several men. Um, it's, it's really hard for me to say how many men he helped out. Um, one of the things that was different about his shelter was he had to charge $20 a night. Hmm. And uh, that was because he got no funding. Yeah. So he, he had to charge. And it was one of those things. It was one of those things where if he felt like, you know, if, 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 you, if he didn't give you shelter, you'd be lying on the sidewalk, right? He would waive the fee. But if he thought that you could afford $20 a night, you know, he would, he would have to say, you know, because he's operating it out of his own pocket. Yeah, exactly. And, I think that's reasonable if uh, if he had no other choice. Yeah. If and he's not he, getting he, funding, then, yeah, he, he still has to keep the lights on, doesn't he? Yeah, and, and it wasn't recognized. I mean, this is the one big thing too, right? It was, it was sort of uh, the media was aware of it, the government was aware of it, but it wasn't um, officially recognized as a domestic violence shelter by the government or by the, uh, you know, Alberta Network of Women's Shelters or the affiliated agencies that can actually bestow any kind of legit legitimacy, again, you know, on, on something like this, right? So it was, it was entirely um, just a uh, one, one guy just trying to do his best uh, for people and for a cause and not getting any breaks at all, mm. at all. And um, eventually uh, he just could not, he couldn't sustain the costs anymore. He, he went bankrupt. He was going completely broke. He lost the house. He had to sell it. And uh, the day the new owner took possession uh, the new owner found him hanging in the garage. Mm. And that was three years ago uh, on the 26th, I think it was. Yeah. So it's almost three years to the day. I can't believe it's been three years. Holy shit. 
Yeah, I think it was it was yeah, twenty it was, it was 20, 2013. 2013. 2014. Are you sure? No, I thought it was 13. 30. I don't know. I it, I yeah, can't. I think, I think it was three years. I, I'm just like, it just seems so freaking recent to me. Yeah, it's it's uh it's been a busy three years, I guess. Well, and I mean, like I can still see him across the table from me at Denny's saying, mm. you know, try, trying to explain to me what it was like talking to a feminist uh, domestic violence crisis worker on a reservation. Um, and he's holding up his coffee cup and he's saying, he's saying to me, okay, explain to me that this is a coffee cup and not a blue Mercedes convertible, mm. right? Because all your explanations as to how it's a coffee cup and not a blue Mercedes convertible, they're just going to go right over my head. Right? Like talking to a brick and, wall, basically. Yeah. 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 Um, and I just, I just remember that um, so vividly um, just, you know, what, what he, what his voice was like, what he, what he looked like, you know, he did you know him, little, did you, did you know him well, little, many, him often? He, uh, not often. I talked to him on the phone fairly often, um, met him a couple of times. He was just this little wiry man. Um, I always thought that when I first met him, I, I had thought he'd be bigger, right? But he was just this tiny little wiry man, small, shorter than me, weighed less than me, I'm sure. Um, you know, gigantic beard, dirt under his nails because he, he worked for a living, um, did physical work for a living. And uh, was just so sincere, just so genuine. Mm. Um, and when I think of, you know, sort of, it was, it was days, days after, uh, he killed himself that there were feminists coming out of the woodwork at like, I forget whether it was Huffington post or slate or what. Yeah. Right? I think it was, uh, slate. Essentially saying that, Oh, his problem was he was a difficult, you know, difficult, angry man who refused to work within the system. <sighs> It's it's a bit hard to work in the system when the the system doesn't recognise you, does isn't it? When the system well, is working against you. When the system tells you, you know, because the first hearing that he tried to 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 get, they told him that um, it's not it's not illegal to discriminate against men, and therefore he does not get a hearing, mm. right? It's perfectly legal in Canada to discriminate against men. And then so he wrote up an argument to present at his second attempt to get a hearing. And uh, the judge or the, uh, the, I guess, the adjudicator that listened to it actually said that it was, uh, might have been a, an appeals court judge, uh, like an actual judge, said that it was a very good argument that as times change, the law needs to change. The law is not static the law is not a stone it is a tree right and some branches die other branches grow and uh, as times change and circumstances change the law needs to change with that and the judge said that that was an excellent argument however <laughs> he was attempting to sue the government for sex discrimination but because there was no agency, ministry, department, or even individual within the government whose responsibility it is to allocate resources for male victims of domestic violence, there is no one in government for him to sue. So, hearing denied. You gotta love the system, don't you? I know, but he just couldn't work with, within the system. Oh, no, he just and, and obviously. To work within the system. Obviously, the system's impossible to work through in, in those circumstances. Yeah. I, I don't know so, what else you can do in those circumstances. 
No, I mean, the best you can do is the best you can do, right? Mm. And he gave it his all. And in his suicide letter, he said that he hoped that his death would shine a light on the problem. And in light of that sentiment, I found that article by that feminist to be in massively poor taste, to put it mildly. Um, that he, in part, right, I don't think this is his whole, this was his whole reason for committing suicide, but it was part of it because I think that if he thought he was, if he thought he would be more useful alive than dead, he would have kept going. Mm. But he, I think he really thought that he would be more useful dead than alive. He would be more useful as a martyr than continuing to beat his head against that brick wall over and over and over again. Well, that, that says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. So speaking of uh, speaking of feminists talking about Earl, I guess we should get on to the the reason why I asked you to to do this hangout, um, and that's to do with the comments from Dawn, who apparently oh. apparently is someone who cares about male victims and uh, has their best interest at heart, and who who is meant to be a an example of a good feminist. Now, you, you read the the thing she said about Earl Silverman. Oh God, I um, oh let me call it up. Yeah, I've, I've um, it here as well. Um, Earl Silverman was a sad, broken man who could have benefited from assistance from a men's center that valued his experience and then helped to make peace with his past and move on to perhaps perhaps help others one day. So I have to ask, uh, let, let's say a, a female was in Earl's situation where she uh, came from an abusive background and she, she um, opened a shelter out of her own pocket to try to help battered women. And then because she was constantly uh, fighting against the system and against that brick wall and got nowhere, she committed suicide. I wonder if Dawn would describe her as sad and broken. I think, I actually think that she might describe her as broken. Um, broken by the system, maybe. Noble, noble but broken. Mm. Um, you know, uh, maybe even sad, like it is sad. It is. It, it it's it's a horrible sad thing. Um, and Earl oh, was it, broken. It is um, sad that he. It is sad that um what happened to him. But I wouldn't describe him as sad. No, no, and he would have benefited from uh, a men's center that could offer him some compassion and some assistance. And I think it would have helped him to go on and be able to more effectively help others. Um, maybe if he had left his relationship 20 years after he did, you know, if he, if he, if he had, if when his relationship ended had been, you know, when the cafe's center for men and families was there, right? when there were actual chapters of cafe in Edmonton, in Calgary, um, and elsewhere, uh, places where he could find support and help and, and, mm. you know, a sympathetic someone, ear someone to talk to someone to help him. I think one, one of the, one of the very difficult things about, um, about stuff like this, is that um, it's often victims helping each other, mm. right? Instead of somebody who's in a good place, right? They're in a stable, good, happy place. Um, that, that's what, what many women get 
right, is they get somebody who is strong and compassionate and solid and, you know, they, they go to a therapist or they go to, you know, um, they, they go to a crisis worker who's just sort of, this is their passion, this is their calling, they want to help rape victims or they want to help domestic violence victims. They not necessarily were one, but they want to help. Um, when, and even if they were a victim, they've been trained right? They've been, they've gone through some kind of process of healing themselves with the help of others and then, you know, and then go on to, to do this. Um, but with, with male victims, it is so often um, victims who are in, in that raw state, finding each other and getting what comfort they can from each other. And none of them are in a position to be generous with their, I guess their spiritual energy or whatever you want to call it. Um, none of them are in a position to uh, be able to afford to give a whole lot. Um, they end up being sort of raw all the time. Yeah. Um, there's no real chance to, to heal. He spent, he, I think he spent so much time, I, like, I think he saw uh, his mission as a way to, um, as a way to heal. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, but I really wish that he'd had some people who could have helped him and, uh, and gotten him into, you know, a place where he was, uh, he, he was healed before he went on his mission, <laughs> you know, cause I think, I think maybe he'd still be alive if, if that had happened. Well, it's interesting. Even if it, it's interesting you even say if, this because, um, sorry. I, I was working on a, a part of this video yesterday where, uh, Dawn in her reply to, to my video in the comment section, uh, said something like most feminists come from abusive backgrounds. And I, I make the point that if, if the, uh, the influential members of the feminist movement come from abusive backgrounds, whether it be their fathers or uh, abusive husbands or whatever, it, it must have a, an effect on them, a bias towards men and masculinity, if that's all they've seen. And especially if they go on to work in a shelter system where they only see female victims of males, that must reinforce that that stereotype that masculinity yeah. is inherently bad and femininity is is victims or, or good. What 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 do you think of that? Oh, I I think that's absolutely the case. I think that um, you know I think Mike Rue said it best. Um, when he was critiquing uh, Wiley Shaw, what was her name? Creepy Bitter Girl. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's one of the doing... videos from the men's rights yeah. movement I ever saw. I'm a big fan of Mike Aru, by the way. Yeah, she was doing slam poetry. Yeah. Dad, daddy never being there. And he's like, oh, what do you know? Daddy issues, right? Um, and uh yeah no if you actually you can go all the way back to um mary wollstonecraft right mm -hmm. she slept on the floor across the threshold of her mother's bedroom door to keep her father out mm -hmm. because her father was abusive and although they were wealthy her father ended up losing everything on, you know, bad investments and confiscated her trust fund and left her with nothing. And so, you know, um, a lot of these, a lot of feminists, uh, they, they have extremely negative experiences with men and, and that does color their thinking. And, and one of the things that I think is a little bit different about, um, someone like Earl, because he had one negative experience with a woman. Um, I don't think that he had, you know, a bad experience with his mother or anything like that. Mm. Um, he never spoke of, of anything like that. Um, 
but uh, I think that because of the differences in the way that we view men and women and the way we so easily see women as being victims and men as being perpetrators. And this is not a feminist innovation. This is just feminists just took it and ran with it. Like yeah, all I, the way. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because of those ways that we already see things, it's very easy for those women in those domestic violence shelters that are populated by abused women or sometimes women who are also abusers, um, maybe mutually abusive or maybe even the predominant aggressor, um, but are in shelters. And the staff of those shelters, the, those feminist staff members, to kind of steep themselves in this sort of Gender men are bad. Child. Yeah, men are bad, mm. men are bad, men are bad, men are violent, all that, right? Well, and I think that... I if, think you're that the that, tenant if you're in that environment and you have that background, I don't know how you can't come to that conclusion. It, it's, um, I think I it's think, understandable, but I, I don't think that it's necessarily realistic. No, it's not realistic. But uh, when it comes to men in, you know, sort of a men's group, um, I think that they're much more forgiving, right? Mm. They may even say things like all women are like that right? All women are hypergamous, right? All women are self-absorbed. All women are vain. All women are fickle, right? All women are this, that, and the other, right? But they don't tend to translate that into all women are evil, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like they're, they're saying that, um, like the, the, the depth of prejudice when you get a bunch of men who have been abused by women, together in a room, right? The most that they'll say, right, is that that women just aren't that great, right? Well, I, I or, think it's, I think it's not all women are that great. I think it's a difference between venting because you've had a bad experience and you want to talk about it and get it off your chest. And, you know, I think it's a difference between that and an ideology. And I, I think that uh, we, we have to be careful not to fall into that trap which I, I see feminism has for you know a good 40 or so years well but i i look at it like um like this i i think that because of that uh the stereotypes that have existed for millennia i guarantee yeah. you woman is victim man as perpetrator mm. um and they're not going away they're not going to go away those stereotypes um, they're, they're even facilitated by our physical appearance as men and women. Mm. So, you know, um, beards being intimidating and, and, uh, women's faces resembling children's faces more than men's do and things like that. So we seem more benign and harmless and, and nice and cute. Right. And, uh, and men seem more intimidating and more threatening. Um, just even judging by how they look. Right. And that is a universal that that is something that registers with one year old babies. Right. Um, one year old babies can can make those judgments. So this is not something that's necessarily being socialized into us. This is I think it's just fundamentally we find baby gorillas cute. We find adult gorillas scary. Right. Because of the way they look. Not mm. just because of how big they are, but because of the way they look, because of what their faces look like. And so when when you look at all of those things, I don't think that the trap that I don't I don't think that men's rights activists are gonna fall into that same trap um that feminists have because No, I, I don't think we will either. I, I have seen <laughs> elements of um MGTOW fall into it though. Yeah, they have to go to a lot of effort to sustain that, though. Yeah, I, and I agree. Like and, and I'm I'm not saying all MGTOW are like that, by the way. But yeah, I no, do I think, think there are some who who echo uh, the radical feminists when they say when they make judgments about all men. Oh, of course. But yeah. I mean, they get they get pushback from the manosphere over that. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. exactly. You know, I, I don't know whether um, 
you know, you even look at someone like Julie Bindle, right? She was no platform that some university in the UK, right? Uh, ironically, because she was going to do a debate with Milo Yiannopoulos on whether feminists uh, are tolerant of free speech. And she was no platform. <laughs> um, yeah. There's no yeah. sense of irony. But anyway. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was absolutely be He was no platform too, but uh, yeah. she was no platform first. He was quite offended that she got the boot before he did. He was mm. like, "Here, I put all this effort into offending people, and uh, and and y y you know, platform her. What the fuck?" But um, the reason she was no platformed was not that she has stated new on numerous occasions that men are scum, that men are dirt, that men can never be civilized, that men should be put in concentration camps you know, under guard mm. um, and only let out when they learn how to behave like human beings, right? And all of this stuff, right, that she says about it. No, it was because she called uh, transgender people like Frankensteins or something like that, right? She she essentially, she doesn't like trans people. Yeah, which isn't surprising considering her brand of feminism. But, uh, yeah, I, I see your point that it's... Um some groups are protected and others well it's it's fuck you isn't it well and and what and you know like it's it like i said it's not it's not that the feminists no platform because of all because of all of that oh you're, you're cutting out karen um oh, you hear me you're back. yeah yeah you're back uh, but it, yeah no it's it's not like the feminists no platformed her because of all of that horrible egregious rhetoric against men Right? No, they're fine with that. Right? Even the mainstream ones. They're yeah, fine with yeah. her saying men. Right? So, um, and yet MGTOW, uh, our radicals, they, they get constant pushback. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I do think we have to be careful of not falling into that trap. Though. I think it's the same with any movement when they start getting larger, that you, you're more likely to get radicals or or people who take things to extremes um i, I don't um, i don't see that with us in the moment at the moment I, i'm sure our position would disagree but uh, i think we do have to be careful not to uh to fall into that trap because we just become our enemy don't we if we do well i i i'm more worried um like i'm i'm not worried about uh us becoming a bunch of woman haters or anything like that because mm. i don't think that i think that that lies in in absolute opposition to what our natural instincts are essentially telling us to feel um you know there is that women are wonderful effect that is i think rooted in our biology and um you know men have a natural outgroup preference for women um so I think that uh, we're actually more uh, we're more likely to end up having a hostile takeover happen, right? Of uh, you know traditionalist women or um, you know progressive women come in and and uh, and take charge and and start calling the shots and telling men to sit down and shut up and things like that. Um, I think we're more in danger of that um, being sort of uh, subverted by um uh female agenda than we are um in terms of uh of becoming like actually misogynistic um you know in in any meaningful way i'm i'm sure there are a, a miso i'm sure there is a misogynist or two genuine misogynist or two in the men's movement you know in general statistically um, there would have to be wouldn't there yeah but uh, I don't I don't think men are capable of um, I think and I've, I've put this I pu I've put it this way in a video before um, that women have a definite sense of us and them and, you know, us women, them men and us women versus them men. Right. Men have a sense of us men and them women but they do not have a sense of us men versus them women. They may be able to have a sense of me man versus them women, right? 
but by and large, men would rather side with the them than the us. So if this is the case, and I think there's a lot of truth in what you say, if this is the case, then how do we change public opinion about male victims of domestic abuse and, and things like that? I think I think one of the um, one of the keys is to highlight uh, how ignoring men's issues harms women, how ignoring men's issues harms children, um, and it really is so you, really sad. So you, sad. So you, sorry, so you might appeal to mothers. Appeal to uh, oh, I'm getting I'm getting uh, a bit of feedback. So you might appeal to mothers that um, their sons might be victims and things like that. You're, you're suggesting something like that. Um, well, okay, here's, here's the way um, Dr. James Brown put it uh, when he did his uh, presentation in Edmonton. Um, he's been spent like 50 years at various levels of education from kindergarten to uh, teaching uh, graduate students. And um, he said, essentially, uh, when, we, when we allow boys to fail in education, um, the, these are the boys that your daughters are gonna date in 10 years. Mm -hmm. These are the boys that your daughters are going to want to marry in 15 years, right? And if if they're living at home with no job and no education, right, and they're failures at life, how is that serving your daughters? Mm. Right? How how is that making your daughter's life better? It's uh, it's sad that we we have to frame things in in such a way. It really is. It it really is, and we often do. Um, mm. Fathers' rights groups get more done when they highlight the potential damage to children of fatherlessness. Uh, almost none of the uh, progress of fathers' rights groups has been achieved through highlighting how men suffer when they're deprived of contact with their children. Mm. It's all about how children suffer when they're deprived of contact with their fathers. That's what get things gets things done. I have heard the opposite, though. I've heard people make the argument that when women, on those rare occasions when they lose custody of their children, how how it damages them and affects them. Which I have no doubt that it it would. But it's just of interesting. Course it's just of interesting that uh, we yeah. don't have the same yeah. sympathy towards men. The whole reason, the whole reason we are so willing to rip children from their fathers, right? Mm. And not even, not even like, you know, sort of, oh, he wants sole custody, but, you know, we're going to give sole custody to her. But he wants some custody. He wants shared custody. And yeah. most men, most men who are divorcing who want custody want shared custody. They do not want sole custody unless the mother is unfit in some way. Right. This is most men. Right. Most women who are divorcing want sole custody. Right. That's what they want. And we see her pain when she loses her kids. We mm. absolutely see it. And we feel for it. And that's the reason we're so willing to take those kids from that man and give them to her or to not give him 50-50 shared custody or 60 40 or whatever right we're, we're willing to give her what she wants because otherwise she'll be all hurty inside well, it's interesting because i've seen some feminists argue that the fact that women are favored in in the um, in custody hearings that's clearly because of patriarchy yet i've, I've heard other groups of feminists argue that uh, when men get custody it's patriarchy because they're you know, taking the kids from, from the mother. So it seems like everything's patriarchy sometimes. Oh, it is. It is. Like the whole reason women get custody and they're, they're, they'll they say it's a patriarchal stereotype that women are only good for making and raising babies. Right? Yeah, but they're and the ones supporting the stereotype by wanting custody. I know. And that's why women get custody. And it's like, no, that's not why women get custody. Women get custody because of Carolyn Norton. Who in the eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, Carolyn yeah. Norton um, appealed to the British courts uh, to change the norm. What the norm was before that was that 
the default was the father would get custody because the father had sole financial responsibility for feeding and sheltering the kids for yeah. all of their necessaries. And she decided that this did not serve women's happiness and it needed to change. So she convinced the British courts uh, to uh, pass the women and infants act, I believe it was called. And um, that essentially made the default uh, switched it to mother custody, although it kept all of the financial responsibility on the father. Mm. And um, so when dad got, custody and got the entire fucking bill that was called male patriarchal privilege and when women get custody and dad get got the full bill right that that was still called patriarchy right and now when women lose custody that's also patriarchy right um yeah no no this is these are not it wasn't privilege when men had it because it was bought and paid for a responsibility. Right? Yes. Uh. It was privilege when women got custody without getting the bill mm. while still being able to stick the man. And now, even if the divorce was her fault, right? In which case she would not qualify for alimony, right? If there were no kids and the divorce was her fault, she would not qualify for alimony. She would leave with nothing but what she went in with at that point in time and uh, her, her property and her solely held property, which at that point in time uh, in the UK was, was hers, was not her, did not go to her husband. So she would leave with only what she came into the marriage with um, and did not get alimony. But the moment she got custody, he was now responsible. He's now responsible to support the household of his minor children of which his ex-wife is the head. So whether she was at fault for the divorce or not, uh, she was now entitled <clears throat> to be supported by him. Yeah, so that, that's hardly equal, is it? If, if someone's got all the benefits um, and the other person's got the responsibility, then it's it's hardly equality. Yeah, and and it wasn't it wasn't some fucking cabal of men twirling their mustaches in a conference room in a hollowed out volcano, right? Who decided <laughs> rip, 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 we're going to give the ladies the custody and therefore they'll never achieve wage equality. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's not what happened. Women mm. wanted it and men yeah. gave it to them. And they still want it. They, they still uh, mainly go for custody, don't they? Oh, there's, there, there's no woman on the planet who is forced to have custody of her children mm. upon divorce. Like I could, if I had wanted to, okay, when I divorced, if he didn't want the kids and I didn't want the kids, I could have called child services and said, take my kids. I would have had to pay child support. I would have had to pay but I would not have had to have the responsibility of custody. Of well, in America, they've got the baby Moses laws where a woman can give away a newborn without any responsibility, without any... In some, uh, in some states, it's up without, to court. And, and they don't even have to inform the father. Yeah, it's in, in, some, in some states, it's up to age 14. You can drop your kids at a baby Moses place. Yeah. Um, and there are only four states, it's all anonymous, there are only four states in which a there are any mechanisms whatsoever to try to locate the biological father, right? Um, to see if he wants custody, if he wants to take responsibility, right? So, yeah, so the sole choice is with the mother, and, and that's that's disgusting. Well, it, it, and you know, like men have a de jour right to do the exact same thing, right? But they don't have a de facto right to do it because when it comes to, particularly when it comes to newborns, but all through, um, all through childhood, uh, maternal custody is, uh, given legal priority over paternal custody. Um, so anytime a man, like, what's he going to do? He's, if, if she doesn't agree, 
to put the baby in in the little basket outside the fire station or whatever, right? If she doesn't want to do that, what's he? He's going to rip the baby out of her arms and walk it down to the fire station and drop it in the basket, and then she's going to go there the next day, right? Mm. Collect her baby and have him arrested for custodial mm. interference and kidnapping, right? So he does not have a de facto right to do this. He has a de jure right. He has the exact same right under the law to use a a baby Moses drop off, right? But he does not have a de facto right because of the way custody is viewed under the law. Uh, is there anything like that in Canada? Do you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, so you got a, a version of the baby Moses law in Canada? Um, I'm I'm sure we do. Uh, like that. We have infanticide. Infanticide is still on our books, on our law books. Uh, it's yes, the, yes, I, I remember Nick bringing that up once. Yeah, it's um, it's a a law that deems that a woman who murders her newborn will serve a sentence no longer than uh, five years. Mm. Because, you know, reasons. Mm. Well, we've, we've drifted I mean, off topic yeah. a little bit. <laughs> should we, should we go back? I think we should. Yeah, it's an enjoyable conversation, uh, but we could be here all day if we don't go back to the yeah, topic. We meander. I, I meander a lot. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, don't be sorry. It's it's an interesting conversation. Uh, but we should should get back on topic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's my fault as a host for not, not reining you in more, but, but I'm enjoying you. listening to you. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so domestic abuse shelters in, in Canada. Um, just let me find Dawn's comment because there was something I wanted to address. Uh, she says, if Earl was offering a legitimate place that dealt with the true realities of men's lives, he would have no issues getting funding to support his goals but he supported the idea that women are as, if not more, abusive than men. Um, those two statements don't make any sense, but side by side, he was acknowledging the reality of men's lives. Women are as, if not more, abusive than, than men in their interpersonal relationships. So he was dealing with the genuine experiences of men. It's, it's interesting because in her interview with uh, Russian Deadpool, Dawn said a couple of times that the, the feminist movement is finally starting to recognize uh, male victims and that they've neglected to do so in the past because they've mainly focused on female victims which I would agree with. Uh, but then she turns around and declares that it's mainly female victims and that there are male victims, sure, but they're a minority. Surely that's a contradiction. Tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Oh, yes. I mean, they exist like, you know, the way, I don't know, spotted owls do, you know, <laughs> or or like some other endangered species. Um yeah, no, it's it, it's it's ridiculous. She's she's not willing to actually look at the research, the data, um, and she's not willing to see women's violence for what it is. And I mean, and I can understand that most people aren't willing to um, to see uh, when when a woman hits a man. Um, most people don't categorize that in their own heads as violent um they, they just don't it's right? often they don't it's even... comical unfortunately yeah no it's comical or they'll be like oh i wonder what he did to deserve that you know because obviously yeah. he did something to deserve it and so you know so they they always see women's violence as reactive um there was uh one researcher who went to great lengths to twist his own fucking findings um, 
to uh, to explain away women's violence as uh, violent resistance, right? So it was the man who was the actual abuser, and her even when she initiated violence, um, she was resisting uh, his abuse and uh, sort of striking upwards, punching upwards, um, and uh, and you know that that there was a justified justifiable prov provocation right like that 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 he she, had obviously done something yeah she wouldn't do she, it unless she had good reason yeah the attitude. yeah yeah i've heard that numerous times unfortunately yeah no and and the the reality is is that women are just uh they can be just as fucked up as men um women can be just as petty and aggressive and jealous and envious and bitter and angry and violent as men can be the mm. the only difference that i see in uh how men and women and violence goes uh is that even very violent men all men tend to do tend this way but even very the most violent men tend to be more violent outside of their relationships than within them, their close relationships. Women tend to be the opposite. They tend to be more violent within their close relationships than outside of them. And I think that that has nothing to do with aggression. Um, I think that women who are violent within their relationships are often aggressive in their informal outside relationships, work relationships, things like that, but they use relational aggression. They use things like gossip mongering and uh, character assassination and whispering campaigns and ruining people's reputations and false allegations and things like that out in public. And they save their actual physical violence because physical violence comes with substantial risks um, and, and less uh, plausible deniability than uh, relational aggression does. And so they save that violence, that, that really overt violence and aggression for an environment in which they feel safe, right? Mm -hmm. Which is their home, um, um, right? And uh, if you look at most of the statistics, especially, um, you know, the, the studies that uh, there was a meta-analysis, massive meta-analysis of 1,700 different studies done by the uh, Partner Abuse um, State of Knowledge Project, PASC, um, they, uh, they found that about 70% of u severe unilateral violence in relationships was female perpetrated. And I think that that is essentially a function not of a uh, greater tendency toward aggression in women, but um, the fact that women often, not always, but often are operating under the assumption that they're never going to get hit back. And for that 70% of unilateral violence, partner violence cases, that's the case, right? that the women are doing the hitting and the men never hit back. Uh, isn't there an argument, though, that men do more damage when they do hit back or when they hit? Of course they do. And mm. this is why it's so important to uh, acknowledge that women are capable of violence and capable of initiating violence and capable of doing it without provocation or without justifiable prov provocation. Um, that Because it is... Uh, Study after study after study has shown that it is when men hit women back that women are most likely to be injured, right? So it's 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 not like that. The whole stereotype of you know sleeping with the enemy and enough and all of those movies on Lifetime TV, right? Mm. All those things where the the man is just like beating the shit out of her for burning the toast or not hanging the hand towels properly in the bathroom or whatever, right? Um, that that if it exists, exists in a minuscule proportion of cases. Um, 
even in cases where men are unilaterally violent, women are less likely to be seriously injured in those cases than in cases of mutual partner violence. It is in cases where women hit first, right? That women mm. are most mm. likely to be severely injured. That needs to be addressed, right? And on top of that, women have all kinds of ways of evening the playing field, right? Throwing heavy objects, hitting with heavy objects, uh, using weapons, uh, stabbing, clawing, biting, grabbing and twisting testicles, right? All of those things, pouring boiling water on your husband, right? Burning some, burning him with an iron, right? Now, there may be cases of women whose husbands do that kind of stuff, but it doesn't seem to follow the general pattern of violence uh, that's a little bit different between men and women. Um, when and you can probably verify this with Aaron Pitsy. Um, when when men get violent and just kind of explode and beat the shit out of their wives, right? What happens is they get angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier, often due to provocation, right? And then they snap and then they just lash out physically, okay? And then it's done, right? And they're not angry anymore. When women abuse men, they hit and then when he responds a certain way they get angrier and they hit again and when he responds a certain way they get angrier and hit more and they escalate and escalate and escalate until one of three things happens she either exhausts herself right mm. um or she or she really hurts him or kills him right or he leaves mm. <clears throat> right? Um, otherwise, she will not stop escalating until he hits her. And often it just takes one slap, just one, and that's just him putting his foot down and saying, you know, you're not going to do that, right? You're hitting me, hitting me, hitting me, hitting me, hitting me. I'm going to slap you back, right? He'll finally do it and she'll stop, right? So essentially, it's a different pattern of escalation, right? Men escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate and then they get violent. Women are violent and escalate their violence through a pattern of escalation of violence, right? Starting with slapping, ending with like freaking clocking the guy with, you know, a tire iron or something like that or stabbing him. Um, and the response that seems to make women, certain women, more angry than anything else is a stance of apology. And what, what do you mean by that? Believe it or not. Um, when the man tries to appease her. So what, what so, do you think? What? Do you think? Well, okay, there well, goes. Okay. Yep, that's better. Um, so so what do you think causes this? Are they, they looking for some kind of um, physical reaction? Would this come from their, their childhood, do you think? It's something that they've grown up with. Well, I think. Well, I think that I think that it's a it's a particularly female uh, pattern, and I think that it it is like the violent aspect of it. I think comes from from childhood experience of abuse or childhood uh, witnessing of abuse between your parents. You know, you learn that violence is the way to do things. Um, that and you grow up thinking that's the way to do things. But I think that what a lot of uh, female violence against male partners is, um, in terms of this sort of pattern of escalation and, uh, and getting angrier, the more apologetic he is, the angrier the woman gets, which you would think would be the opposite. Mm. Um, but I think that that's actually shit testing behavior. It's just extremely uh, okay. dysfunctional 
violent shit testing behavior. It is the shit testing behavior of a woman who experienced a childhood filled with abuse. So, so no doubt at this point, there are probably some people watching who um, find a lot of this hard to believe. Do, do you have any studies that you would recommend that they check out? What would be the, the main evidence? Uh, the, the one, the, I mean, every, everybody points to Martin Thiebert's bibliography, which has, God, 300 and some studies uh, and, uh, and surveys in it. Uh, demonstrating that women are at least as violent as men in their relationships. I would recommend that. I would recommend Denise A. Hines. Um, she's done uh, a whole bunch of um, of research on battered men, on uh, men's experience within the system, uh, male the experience of male victims within the system, um, sexual violence against men, all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, I would recommend uh, PASC, the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project. Um, like I said, it was a massive meta-analysis of 1,700 different studies, and uh, it's, it's um, easily Googleable. Uh, I would suggest Murray Strauss, Susan Steinmetz, um, Richard Gellis, uh, Donald Dutton. So yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, of researchers who are highly interested and motivated in this field, and uh, and who have a lot of research published. I mean, Murray Strauss was essentially the guy who published the first of all of the studies that showed gender symmetry in partner violence, and he did it. As a feminist, he had published a bunch of studies using the feminist methodology of asking women about their victimization and men about their perpetration. And uh, somebody mentioned to him that it, he was being biased and he, he said, okay, well, fine, I'll do it your way and I'll ask them all the same questions and you'll see it'll be a slam dunk. Men are violent. It's patriarchal. And he got the shock of his life. So, so where do we go from here? Because it seems that feminists are starting to admit that women can be violent too, uh, but they they don't want to accept um, the fact that women can be equally as violent, or you know, forty percent, or many of the other figures which are often thrown around by men's rights activists. How, how do we find a, a middle ground to discuss this, or can we find a middle ground to discuss it? Or is it um, way I don't. Gone? I don't. I don't know that we can find a middle ground to discuss it with feminists because, um, be, because they have their grand unifying theory of patriarchy, right? Do you think they're and, so invested in it? Um. Oh, it is. It is their their god and their devil. Mm. Um. Absolutely, and and they are true believers, and because. They've used, in particular, intimate partner violence and sexual violence, and to a lesser extent, family violence, as a sort of evidentiary pillars holding up this unifying theory of patriarchy, right? In, in this sort of circular argument, well, patriarchy exists, that's why men beat women. Men beat women, therefore patriarchy exists. Mm. Yeah, they right? tend to use a lot of circular arguments. <laughs> Yeah, and and so um, they're they're going to be highly resistant to anything that threatens uh, their theories, their sort of pet theories around intimate partner violence, sexual violence, systemic gendered violence against women, um, harassment online. You know, uh, women being victimized because they're women, particularly if they frame it as um, male perpetrated, right? And because, because those things demonstrate patriarchy and make patriarchy seem more like a solid, actual, real thing um, to other people. And so admitting that, like, it's essentially like you take away sexual violence, you take away intimate partner violence, and you take away um, harassment, 
and you're left with a table with no legs. Mm. Right. And patriarchy sitting on top of it, but the table has no legs. The reason why I ask is because I have seen a slight change in maybe the last year or so uh, where men's issues are slowly starting to be acknowledged as uh, actually existing. I mean, I'd start making videos, was it about three years ago? And, and that time, whenever someone brought up men's issues, it was like, no, men don't have issues. Only women have issues. Mm -hmm. And then it, then it shifted to, yeah, men have issues, but only feminism can deal with them. And now it seems mm -hmm. to be shifted to, yes, men have issues, and there, there is a need for a, a legitimate men's rights movement, but um, they're only anti-feminists, so we, we can just dismiss them as not really being legitimate men's rights activists. So there yeah, is a well, shift. There is a shift, and slowly they're starting to acknowledge that men can be victims too and men have issues. And yes. it, it, makes, it makes me wonder two things. The first thing is... Um, where do we go from here? How do we, you know, do we just keep up the momentum and they'll eventually change or is it going to, is it going to reach a tipping point? And the second point is how much of this has come around because of people like us demanding that we, we talk about these issues? Um, okay. Well, the, they are willing to accept that men are victims of patriarchy, right? Yes, so men are yeah. victims. Men are victims of a system that men constructed to benefit themselves, right, um, at the expense of women. And, and, and women are, uh, it, women experience benevolent sexism under this system. They'll admit that too, right? So women experience uh, extra nice treatment under a system that men constructed to benefit themselves at the expense of women, right? So we already know that they're not really thinking very rationally, okay? Um, because now, they're invested in an ideology. They are. And, yeah. and the, the problem is, uh, and, and this is, this is why, even if you show them studies that show gender symmetry or even higher rates of female perpetration than male perpetration in heterosexual couples and, and that lesbian couples have the highest rates of violence and, and gay men, the lowest rates, right? Which is almost um, universally ignored for some reason. Oh, well, it's ignore. I'll tell you why is because they desperately want to believe that when men commit violence against women, it's systemic. It's part mm. of the patriarchy. It's normalized by patriarchy. It's encouraged, endorsed, and uh, almost required by patriarchal societies, patriarchal norms. Male and, violence and lesbian and violence doesn't fit into that model. Yeah. Well, it, it it can, in terms of it's an aberration that that woman was actually being like a man. Yeah, right? I've heard that before. Um, so. Or or whatever. Um, but they 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 really want to portray female violence against men as an anomaly, as a sort of a random thing. Um, and, and not really, you know, uh, or, or, you know, there's reasons for it. Right. So, yeah. so when a man beats his wife, it was the patriarchy that, you know, told him that, that was the right thing to do. Right. Um, when, when a woman beats her husband, it was because she under, she, she was, you know, she had a, a childhood filled with abuse and horrible things and, and nastiness and trauma. Right. And that's why she does this. Right. Mm. They aren't going to look at the man's history of childhood abuse and trauma and, and all of that stuff, because that the, in their minds, that's not what's causing it. What's causing it is patriarchal masculinity. Right? So, you start, so they, you start with the answer and then you work backwards. Yes. And they want to define and they have always defined these particular things intimate partner violence, sexual violence, um, and uh, similar uh, forms of bad behavior, war, right? All kinds of stuff as uh, definitionally male, right? Um, th these are masculine norms. Uh, a world run by women would be peaceful. There would be no war, blah, 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 bullshit, 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 right? Um, 
so because because a world run by women would not be patriarchal right it would not be sub subject to patriarchal norms it would you know and so essentially they're they're not willing to let go of abuse and rape as being by definition male behaviors so do you think we'll get much more of a shift like i said we have seen some shift but how far can that shift go if if they're so dedicated to patriarchy well, theory i think i think we can't i don't i don't think we should waste time trying to convince feminists i think we need to uh go over under around or bulldoze through them and actually reach the sensible people out there in society in society i, I, I think i would agree i think that they have shifted because we're starting to reach a wider audience. I don't yeah, think they like have the, a choice, but I, I still have to wonder how far they can shift if they're, they're so dedicated to patriarchy theory. Obviously, they have I to do. reach a point where they say, no, we, we can't go any further, or they have to change the, the very basis of their ideology. Well, I think on on an individual level, there there are and have been and will be more and more people abandoning the faith. Um, mm -hmm. Like I've had feminists uh, who who were, you know, who described themselves as you know pretty devout, right? Pretty enthusiastic about feminism, write to me and say thank you for opening my eyes, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I mean, like th there is hope for for lots and lots of feminists out there to change their minds but changing their minds it does not mean giving an inch of ground and and saying okay well you know patriarchy hurts men too no they have to actually abandon the entire faith and one one of the really awful things about this is that there are so many women who have made careers on this bullshit right they have built a body of work um they they have papers published they teach courses they they constructed you know entire curricula you know programs um women's studies programs in universities right they they've built their entire lives on this right and at some point the sunken cost fallacy kicks in and they're going to stick with it like a gambler at a blackjack table who's now offering his fucking firstborn child, right? Because this has got to be the hand that I win, right? Because I've, I've lost so much money. It's got to pay off some, sometime. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so I like, I, I think, I think that there are some who are never going to be reachable. Um, they will die died in the wool feminists because I, I, and it, it, I don't doubt that but surely there's an ever-growing number of coffee shop feminists who are soft feminists whatever you want to call them who don't hold on to patriarchy theory in exactly the same way in fact, probably, probably a lot of them don't even know what patriarchy theory is they, yeah you know, I they, think I think that a lot of those those particular women, you know, like they 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 sort of they've been told that feminism means equality between men and women, mm. and they think it's great, and and so they're femi Of course, I'm a feminist, right? And they don't understand uh, all of the baggage that's attached to it, and they don't understand what people are actually being taught in women's studies courses and um, instructed to believe is is actually true when it's when it's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, I'm sure that there are some things that are true that are taught in women's studies, um, but a lot of it is completely bogus, and most of the contextualizing of it is is ridiculous. But um, I'm I'm sure that like we've seen the numbers, the percentage of people who call themselves feminists in the U.S. has gone from about 25 percent a couple of years ago to 18 percent. Um, in the UK, it was about 20 or 25 percent, and now it's something like 8 percent. Mm. Right. So we're really seeing a mass exodus from the movement. And one of the nice things about it, and, and I'm going to plug Nick Redding's video, the feminist, non-feminist cooperation spiral. Oh, yes. Uh, everybody, everybody should go watch that if they haven't already. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll put a link in the description. 
Yeah, what what ends up happening is that um, as feminists see their stranglehold on the discourse, you know, being being eroded, um, mm -hmm. and and you know, like the rest of us are trying to pry that discourse out of their their kung fu grip, um, they and as they they lose legitimate things to complain about, right? Because every problem that gets solved. That's something that they they can no longer legitimately complain about, right? So then they got to get into man spreading and mansplaining and man slamming and man interrupting and all of this other bullshit, right? Um, sexist air conditioning and all of that stuff. And they're yeah. they're screaming just as loudly as they were about uh, the vote and and you know uh, no fault divorce and abortion and you know uh, con contraception. Um, you know, being able to get contraception as a single woman, you know, initially it was only authorized for married women. Um, so essentially you have them sort of screaming ever louder over ever more trivial shit. And then we challenge them. And then what do they respond with? Not a counter argument, but screechy ad hominems a la Big Red. <laughs> anyway <laughs> and um and then the general public sees that yeah right yeah and then the general public is like wait a minute those bitches be crazy yo and then the feminists get even more mad and it just goes around in like a cycle of like a positive feedback loop of essentially us getting to the point where we just have to let them discredit themselves. Oh, I fully agree. Uh, I, I think the, the best thing we can do is shine a bright spotlight on, on the bullshit. Yeah. I'm, I'm not against there being a women's rights movement. I, I think there's nothing wrong with having a special interest group. It's just the, the type that there is. I disagree with. Um. Yeah, no, I, if, if it wasn't, all attached to patriarchy theory and all of that other stuff. Exactly. Um, I think I think I could get behind it. I mean, like I have actually um, in my in my previous life as a dirty book writer, um, I did speak quite vocally, quite openly about um, uh, women's issues. Uh, spoke quite openly against some extremely misogynistic kind of gross behavior from the uh the erotica fandom um women from women um just being being having issues with uh you know thinking women's body parts are gross and uh and not wanting to read about them because they're disgusting and and uh uh, lesbophobia, right? Oh, if I, one of them said, uh, if I came across a scene in a book where I thought two women were about to kiss, I'd rip out the pages before I threw it in the garbage, right? So that no one else would be subjected to that filth, right? I mean, so there was a lot of weird, and these were women who were reading, like, about dudes butt-fucking each other constantly, right? So it wasn't homophobia, it was lesbophobia, and and some kind of fucked up view of women. And these were women. And I wrote extensively about that, saying, you know, y you got a fucked up attitude, right? It's not okay to, you know, uh, make people feel shitty about their, their body parts, like, Nobody, nobody has the choice of whether they're born with a vagina or not. Um, I, I don't really like hearing that it's gross. Thanks. You know, well, one one thing I've I've had disagreements with with the uh, skeptic feminists in the past is the the term anti-feminist. They seem to to really hate the term anti-feminist. But from my perspective, I I think it's a good thing to have a. Uh, a counter movement or some group which is going to criticize a movement fairly because it tends to keep them on track. Uh, if you have no criticism, then you tend to create echo chambers and, and fall into all kinds of traps. 
So I, I think a, um, a reasonable criticism of the, the bad aspects of feminism isn't a bad thing. And I'd even go as far as to say that reasonable, let me stress that, reasonable criticism of the men's rights movement is a good thing because it keeps us on track. Um, yeah. But they, they seem not to like the, the term anti-feminist. Why? I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely retarded. Um, well, you know, well, I mean, I mean, let's I, call I, ourselves... Let's call ourselves Slarty Bartfast instead. Okay. Well, I guess I, I, I guess I could call myself um, anti-feminist patriarchy theory, theorist or, or something like that. But it's kind of a mouthful, isn't it? You know, that, that know. would sum up my, my issue. I disagree with patriarchy theory and some of the other ideologies. I'm anti them. Uh, by, by calling myself anti-feminist, it's, it's an easy way to to sum up that. But... I don't know. I, I don't think it's a bad thing to have criticism of any movement, inc including ours, as long as it's fair. Unfortunately, yeah. most, most of the criticism lobbied at us isn't fair or accurate or in any way truthful. But, you know. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, no, we're all Elliot Roger, don't you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just give me a second. Shh. All right. Sorry. That's all right. I, I I just had a kid come in the door, so. Um, but uh, no, it's 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 like uh, every every movement requires criticism, and it requires criticism from outside of it. Um, like this is the thing that that these feminists seem to think that just the movement can police itself, just like mm. the cops can police themselves, right? And the government can police itself, and nobody needs a watchdog. You know, yeah, external examples actually. <laughs> yeah, like, like I'm sorry, but uh, no, no, you need outside criticism in order to, if only to like sharpen your freaking teeth. You yeah, know, exactly. On, on, on fresh meat, right? So you know, fresh dumb arguments from today's dumb feminist, right? Um, who doesn't have an argument? Like that, that's really like, I would love, I would love an actual argument. And there have been people who have actually challenged my ideas and my views, right? But they're not feminists, mm. right? There was one, he, he was the editor of a philosophy magazine uh, in the UK that, uh, they had taken the printed, they'd, they'd gotten rid of the print edition and they were going to do a relaunch of, uh, of the magazine online only. And I did a six hour interview with him, six hours, mm. just talking to this guy. And he transcribed the entire thing and printed it. And he challenged me. He was challenging, right? Well, it's good though. I mean, that that's what any movement needs. Otherwise, yeah. like like I said, you descend into to echo chambers and and you get too invested in your own ideology. But the the reason why I bring it up is because what do we get from feminists? Naomi Wolf. What? You're a rape apologist now? Yeah, yeah. But the yeah, reason why I bring it up is because I I don't think the the shift, small as it is, in the feminist movement to acknowledge male victims of domestic abuse. I don't think that would have happened without non-feminists or anti-feminists giving pushback. It's only through that that they finally started to shift and, and give themselves a pat on the back over it. Like, you know, well, like, look, look at us now. We're, we're inclusive of men too. <laughs> well, what, what, what I thought is, uh, you know, what I think is absolutely hilarious is that um, a lot of them are trying to take credit for it, that yeah. it's happening and the, the change has come because of feminism and despite MRAs, even though, even though it's only because MRAs have kicked and screamed for long enough that the mainstream, regular people, non-feminist people are going, what the fuck is this bullshit, right? Mm. And feminists can no longer pretend that male victims don't exist. Yeah. Right? So they had to, and then they want to take credit for that. Yeah, I know it's 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 crazy. 
Oh my God. It just, it, it makes me want to, uh, it makes me want to like freaking, uh, I don't know, throw a rock through a window or some shit. <laughs> yes. Like, it, it, it is infuriating. Oh, it's awful. So. Mm. Anyway, this has been fun, Karen, but we've been going on for, uh, I think, two hours or something like that. So we should probably um, call it to an end, if that's cool. Has it's it, been fun, though. I think it's been three hours. I think we, we started chatting off air about three hours ago, but it took us a while to get to air. Yeah, so, but, um, yeah. It, it, I, it's, I, been I should it's been fun. It we, has. Should, we should do it again. Uh oh, you're all breaking up. Maybe it's oh, a good thing I? that we're calling it quits. Can you hear me now? Oh, now you're good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, no, no, it was it was great. I I don't know if I've ever had the have I ever had the pleasure of being on a live stream with you? Not one on one. I don't. Not one on one, but on on a live stream with you at some point. Yeah, we did that. I oh, did that um, end of year hangout. Right there, yeah. we go. I'm I'm probably going to do uh, a mid year one sometime soon too. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, I, I think if yeah. we can do that twice a year, that that would be quite good. Mm hmm. Mm. Definitely takes a bit of organising but, though. <laughs> oh god, it's like fucking herding cats. Like if yeah, and you know, there's going to be even more people this time. So. If anybody's scared that the MRM is going to like, you know, you know, in 10 years, women will be back in the kitchen, chained to their stoves and shit. Like we can get anything accomplished. Um, yeah, no, we can't even <laughs> make it to a hangout <laughs> on time. Right. So like, I just, I, I, I don't think that there's a whole lot to worry about as far as us going too far. I think, like I said, I think that um, for the most part, men in general, um, we'll be happy with a, a slight correction, right? A slight easing back towards the mm. middle, um, not the direct middle, not perfect equality. They they don't need that. I don't think men need that in order to be satisfied um, for the most part. And uh, and once that happens, um, the the whole movement's just going to disintegrate, right? It's it's just going to well, lose its. I'll, I'll, I mean, it, I'll still be there in, until we get you know equal sentencing and and uh, ban circumcision and things like that. Oh well, banning <laughs> circumcision. That I, means... there may only That's... be five of us, but <laughs> I'll still be there. You'll you'll be like ninety years old, like, <laughs> and then I left the house and I tied an onion to my belt because that was the start at the time and. If I'm then lucky. I to watch him sign that historic bill banning circumcision. So, uh, yeah. Well, you never know. You know, we we have to uh, keep up hope, don't we? We do. No, I can't. Oh my god, you make such a mess. Sorry. <laughs> I'm All right, talking to. All right. <laughs> we'll we'll do this that. again soon. All right, excellent. It was nice talking to you, and I hope you got some usable material. Oh yeah, I, I've actually got more than enough. What I think I'll do is I'll I'll edit out some of the key points about um, Earl, and I'll put it at my the end of my video, and then I'll put most of this chat up on my second channel uh, because it, okay. it was quite interesting. So I think I'll keep it, you know, fairly intact. Uh, I might cut out some yeah. of the the bits where you know the mic cuts out or something, but. That, that's about it. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Shoot me a link um, yep. on, of the, uh, of the uh, big one on your other channel. Cool. Um, I always, I always get a notification when you upload something to your main one. So you, you, you're not subscribed to my second one. No, I, I oh. do you know how many subscriptions I have? I, no, I, I know. Just, I know. I'm, I'm the same I'm way. Not, to Sargon's live there, and it's, it's like more than one channel, really, really. Uh, it was because I got the the copyright strike. I thought it's good to have a, a backup channel. 
Oh yeah, okay. And I thought I'll so, make it. Uh, I thought I'll make it a hangout channel. Um, that's a so good idea. Yeah, I have. I have toyed with the idea of having one just for um, propaganda of toxic feminism, just in case I ever get another copyright strike. I can still upload full episodes no. to that one, but I yeah. just haven't got around to it. I've been too busy. You know what you should do? Because I noticed mm. I was looking for them on your channel because I, I hadn't for some reason because I have a playlist of the propaganda of toxic feminism yep. on you know, on my channel. And, and I was looking for them because I had forgotten to add uh, maybe three or four of the most recent videos and I wanted to add mm. them in order. And, and uh, you don't have them in a playlist. Yeah, I know. I know. I've, I've got a bit slack in maintaining my channel. So what the hell, babe? I know. I know. I, know. I have them in a playlist. Well, it, my, my free time is divided up either in making videos, which tends to be fairly time consuming, or not trying mm -hmm. to think about gender issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I tend to fall behind in answering mail and uh, maintaining the upkeep of my channel and facebook although i've got a bit of help recently on facebook on my bain account so that's good that's good I've i need a, a personal subscriber yeah i need a personal assistant myself you know if you know anybody who's willing to work for free <laughs> um, i'll figure something out Hi everyone, I'm Phil from Cafe Vancouver and this is Jesse and you, Gigi, and we're from SFU AMB. We're gathered here today to remember Earl Silverman. Earl was a longtime men's rights advocate and founded the Calgary Men's Alternative Safe House in 2010, believed to be the only men's domestic violence shelter in Canada at that time. By all reports, Earl gave everything he had to keep the safe house open and raise awareness of the fact that women and men are victims of domestic violence at virtually equal numbers, yet victim resources are made available almost exclusively to women. Tragically, neither the media nor the Canadian government paid attention. After three years of running the safe house out of his own home and denied funding multiple times, Earl was forced to sell his home and close the safe house. Earl himself had been a victim of domestic violence. Quote, when I went into the community looking for some support services, I couldn't find any. There were a lot for women, and the only programs for men were for anger management. As a victim, I was re-victimized by having these services telling me that I wasn't a victim, but I was a perpetrator. Shortly after Earl was forced to close the safe house, in the early morning hours of April 26, 2013, he penned a three-page letter to his friends and loved ones and then hung himself. In his final years, Earl devoted his life to working for fairness and justice for men and their families. In his letter, he wrote that a, he hoped a review of his death would help create services for men. In 2014, CAFE launched the first Canadian Centre for Men and Families that offers shelter for male victims in the Toronto area. It remains open to this day. None of us ever met Earl, but all of us here today fighting for issues affecting men and boys know we're standing on the shoulders of brave men like Earl who would not stay quiet. Earl Silverman, you will not be forgotten, and we, we will, will not stay, stay quiet. quiet. Please share this video with the hashtag RememberEarl.